This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Well, good morning. It's kind of a treat to be today at a place on the Oregon Trail. Uh, I suppose it's only worth it for me to say that I have been, in years gone by, a real student of the Oregon Trail. In fact, if you go upstairs to my office, I have a whole shelf of books and DVDs and journals and maps and even little stones from the North Platte River, and uh, all kinds of souvenirs, boxes that I, of things that I have found and gathered. And uh, I have always been fascinated by the Oregon Trail. Uh, the other thing, historically, that I've loved to study is Lewis and Clark. And uh, I saw it this way. Lewis and Clark uh, basically unlocked the door to the West but it was the Oregon Trail that opened the door to the West. And, uh, you know, I think about the fact that Lewis and Clark expedition was made up of a bunch of tough guys. Uh, the Oregon Trail was basically a bunch of families, men, women, children, babies, grandparents, and I still marvel that folks made that 2,000-mile journey uh, across the country through just some of the most amazing circumstances. And uh, so it's always fascinating. But you know what I have learned in my study of the Oregon Trail? Do you know what was the most valuable possession to those families on that trip? It wasn't their gun. It wasn't their axe. It wasn't their team of oxen. It wasn't their covered wagon. Do you know what it was? It was a book. And those books, and I have a bunch of them, were the trail guides or the trail handbooks that had been prepared. And it is said that as those people set out on that amazing expedition, that book was absolutely priceless because it gave them everything they needed to know about where they were going and what they were going to do on the way. And you know, I've thought about that many times. What a great practical lesson. Uh, folks, it's not the 1800s any longer, and we're not traveling in covered wagons, and we're not shooting flintlock rifles a whole lot anymore. But you know what? We're all on a journey, aren't we? And you know the most valuable possession we have in this journey is a book. And I guess that's why I love a time like this, this week, this Sunday school class, where we just come together as a group of people who are on a journey and say, let's take the handbook. Let's take the trail guide. Not written by explorers and pioneers and cowboys, but by God himself. A book that God has given to me and you to guide us on this journey. And so that's why I'm excited about this week, because I feel like we can come together throughout this week and just open the trail guide and say, God, we want to know what your plan is. We want to know how you want us to live, how you want us to go through life. And this book is going to guide us. So anyhow, that's a freebie. I'm not preaching this morning on the Oregon Trail, but I just feel like it, it kind of creates a, a neat little backdrop, doesn't it, for exactly where we are today, and uh, we're looking forward to what God has for us. I want to give you a simple little handout this morning, and uh, I would encourage you to maybe take this and just kind of 
grab one, pass it on, tuck that into your Bible this week because we'll be referencing this from time to time as we talk about what we're calling the building blocks of revival. Folks, the word revival is pitifully misunderstood in our modern church. I I really think that to many folks, revival is a scheduled event. It's a matter of four days or six days or it's a matter of two weeks or it's something we schedule. We're having a revival. And to most folks, it's sermons, songs, and services. And that's what it is. And then we get it over with and life gets back to normal and on we go. Well, folks, I happen to believe that revival is much more than an event. It's an experience. It's a life-changing experience. And by the way, God forbid we ever get back to normal if we've had a genuine revival experience. And so this week, we're going to be talking about some of the things that are a part of that process. And I hope and pray that as we meet together with God, God will speak to us and give us exactly what we need. Let's take our Bibles this morning. And will you open them with me, please, to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm just going to use one simple verse this morning and three simple lessons from this verse that I believe are essential in helping to prepare us for that which God wants to do among us this week. Folks, these are not meetings with the Palmers. Can I tell you, if you have come because you want to meet with the Palmers, you're going to be disappointed. I say it probably without exception every time I start into a week of meetings We've got to move beyond meeting with the Palmers and realize we're here to meet with God. And that's where this verse is going to help us this morning to get our focus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says this, For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, Ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Notice the emphasis upon the word of God. What are we talking about? We're talking about that handbook, remember? That trail guide. We're talking about the very Word of God that you and I have in front of us this morning. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us, and then I want to give you three things about it today. Father, it is a great privilege, it is a great blessing to open this book this morning. God, we don't want to hear simply the words of a guest preacher, a man who has opinions and ideas. Lord, we want a word from the Lord today and throughout this week. And I pray that you will give us exactly what we need to hear as we go through this week. God, help me now as I speak. I want to be biblical and appropriate in what I share. And so may this message, may this lesson be exactly what you have for us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, Psalm chapter 85 is one of the great revival chapters in Scripture. It's a prayer. I happen to believe that whatever God does in revival, God does in answer to prayer. You can't separate the two. Revived people are praying people. Praying people are revived people. They they go together. Well, it's verse 6 of Psalm 85 where the psalmist prays, Wilt thou not revive us again? It's a prayer for revival. But it's only two verses later, verse number 8, that the psalmist said, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. 
Folks, one of the outstanding characteristics of a meeting with God is that God speaks. God has something to say. Folks, there is not a word that I personally can say that will change your life. But what God says can transform your life. And I think that's what Paul was focused on when he wrote to the Thessalonians in a spirit of thanksgiving. He's grateful because they had responded properly to the Word of God. And so it's in this verse that there are three things that stand out. And I want to show them to you this morning. Three words that begin with the letter R. The first is the word reception. The reception of God's truth. Notice how Paul says, Ye received the word of God which ye heard of us. I have this summer kind of begun a personal refresher course, you might say, in the subject of preaching. Part of it came about because I was in India in July and I was teaching in a Bible college. I was teaching for a number of days to literally hundreds of pastors and I began to kind of go back and just lay out for myself but also to teach a study of the subject of preaching. I'm a preacher. And so I began to work it through and it's been a neat study and I'm still kind of working on it, not real aggressively, but just trying to refresh my, my understanding of this great responsibility. But there's one thought that has stood out to me through all of this, and it's a quote by Tom Farrell who made the statement, something to this effect, the preacher becomes a voice for deity. What was he saying? He was saying that a human voice communicates the Word of God. That's what Paul was saying. Ye received the Word of God which ye heard of us. In other words, Paul says, I became a voice for or a voice of deity. The key is, Ye received it. Folks, God has manifested His Word through preaching. Doesn't matter whether it's a guest preacher or your pastor. Doesn't matter whether it's a speaker on the, the radio or the TV or the internet or, or whatever the case may be. God takes the voice of a man and uses it to communicate his own word. And it's important that we receive it. But here's the problem. Nobody ever receives it simply by coincidence. I don't know if you have thought this through like I have, but I have sensed a tremendous change in churches in the years of our revival ministry. What do I mean by that? I simply mean that reception has changed. Honestly, it was not that long ago, 15, 20 years ago, that we could come to a church and we could announce on Sunday morning we're going to meet with God. And as a preacher, I could get up and open my Bible and say, open your, your Bible, we're going to hear from God tonight. And you know what? It was like speaking to a basket of sponges. They just soaked it up. I can think of meetings that would go Sunday through Sunday. And on Sunday night, people would be saying, we can't stop. 
I remember a service in Houston, Mississippi. It was kind of like going to the mission field, to be honest with you. It was almost like being in a foreign country. I'm not being unkind. It just it, they, they talked different and they ate different things and it was just all different. But God met with us that week. And I remember on a Sunday night, a deacon standing up in the service and saying, Folks, the Palmers aren't going anywhere for another week. They don't have another commitment for another week. Why don't we have more of these services? And the people are like, Amen, bring it. What was the key? Key was reception. They wanted it. There was an appetite, a spiritual desire. I remember years ago reading, or I'm sorry, hearing uh, Evangelist Lester Roloff, kind of one of the old timers, relating how as a boy, he could go with a friend to the old country store and they could walk in the store with a coin, a, a nickel, buy a whole bag of candy. And he said they would go out and sit on the front steps of the old country store and eat the whole bag of candy. And he said then he would go home and sit down at the table and his mother would put a whole plate of meat and potatoes and vegetables in front of him. And he'd just look at it and go, oh. Then Dr. Roloff said this. My problem was I was so full of junk, I didn't have room for the good stuff. I wonder if the 21st century has turned the church, turned Christians into a bunch of spiritual Junk food junkies, if you know what I'm saying. So full of the junk that we don't have room for the good stuff. Paul said to these people, you received it. What do we say? Attitude is everything. It's amazing what happens when we begin to hunger and thirst after righteousness. What did Jesus promise? We'll be filled. I've noticed, in fact, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago in a meeting. We are a generation that has become busy, noisy, and crazy. So you know what that means? We spend much of our lives with our fingers on a keyboard, our eyes on a screen, and our ears with earphones. And you know what it has done to us? It has created a mental overload. Oh, it's the information age we live in, the 21st century. Isn't it great? The world is right at your fingertips. I'm not sure it is great. You know why? Because what happens, we open this book, God wants to speak. And what do we do? Men, women, brothers, sisters, God has something to say. And people just sit there and go, oh. People wonder why Christianity is in the state of affairs it's in in this generation, I'm telling you it's because we have missed out on the reception of God's truth. We're not getting it. We were, we were uh, somewhere here a week or two ago, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the churches had a sign. You know how they put messages on their church sign board? And it said something like this, a Seven days without God or God's Word makes one week. And then it spelled it W-E-A-K. See? It has been shocking to me, and I have done this to distribute surveys in some of the best churches I've preached in, to just ask people about their relationship to the Word of God. It shocks me how many people have limited their relationship to the Word of God to Sunday morning when the preacher says, let's open two. Really? We're not 
receiving. Folks, if the Word of God is going to transform us because of the communication of God, number one, there has got to be the reception of God's truth. But let me give you a second thing. Number two, there has got to be a recognition of biblical authority. Back to our verse. Ye received it not as the word of men. Isn't it amazing? Here we go again. Modern Christianity has become fascinated with personalities and celebrities. You've got to go here, doctor, whoever he may be. You've got to come here, brother, whoever he is. Oh, he's tremendous. He's such a good speaker. You know, I remember some years ago hearing about a speaker and the comment was, man, he is the best to speak to teenagers. He is funnier than anybody you've ever heard. So I heard him preach and I sat there and I thought, well, he is funny. You're right. But what do the kids go away talking about? The jokes or the truth? See, folks? Paul says, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. A number of years ago, I attended a pastor's conference And the conference actually began with a formal banquet. And uh, so we were in a beautiful dining hall and we were standing around the tables and we were kind of introducing ourselves to each other, getting acquainted. And I remember meeting a pastor who I had never met before. I knew of him but didn't know him personally. We sat down. They had an opening prayer. This brother looks across the table at me and he said to me, "Uh, what do you think? is the greatest battle being fought in our churches today. Folks, I did not hesitate five seconds. I said the greatest battle that I see is the battle over the authority of the Word of God. The battle is not whether it is or isn't the Word of God. We're good with that. Most of us claim that it's the inspired, infallible, inerrant, preserved, eternal, so on and so forth. We know all those adjectives, word of God. We're good there. The problem is, will we let it be the final authority in our lives? Folks, we desperately need a back to the Bible Revival of biblical authority. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. But you know what? That's not happening in our churches in this day and age. We've got people who are saying, well, I know what the Bible says, but my situation's different. Folks, may I remind you that you don't change the Word of God to fit your situation. You change your situation to fit with the Word of God. People say, well, the Bible and I don't agree. Guess who's wrong? (laughs) Guess who's wrong? A recognition of biblical authority. I have a letter at home. Uh, it was written to me personally by the Vice President of the United States, our current Vice President of the United States. Uh, We had a revival prayer meeting that went on for a number of years back in Pennsylvania, and one of the things that I did during that time was we, we spent several weeks just praying for some of our national leaders, our state leaders, our local leaders, and we had prepared a letter and I I wrote a personal letter to these leaders that we were praying for, let them know that we were praying for them. Sent out probably close to 40 of them. 
Interestingly enough, out of the 40 letters that I sent, the only letter I got in response was from Vice President Joe Biden. This is not politically driven. I'm not supporting or anything. I'm just saying that's the letter I got. The the Vice President of the United States thanking me for my letter, thanking me for our prayers, and actually giving me several specific things he needed us to pray for. Here's what I'm trying to say. That letter came on a simple piece of paper. To be honest with you, the piece of paper itself was no more valuable than this piece of paper. Uh, 500 sheets in a ream, you can buy a ream at Walmart for three or four or five dollars. We're, we're talking about a penny a page, okay? The piece of paper itself was not the value. What made the piece of paper valuable was who wrote what was on the paper. See? You know what always amazes me? Is when I take this book, to be honest with you, the the leather cover, the, the pages of paper, the ink, no big deal. In fact, this Bible I bought at an outlet for just hardly anything. But do you know why this book is so valuable? Because of who wrote it. God wrote it. Folks, in your lap this morning, in your hands, you are holding a copy of the book God wrote. A personal copy. You know, it's interesting... I, I looked this up earlier in the year, and I'm not even sure I've got it exactly correct now in my memory, but the Library of Congress in Washington, if I'm not mistaken, has over 130 million different books in it. I have to, don't, please don't quote me on that. I'm just trying to recall. Basically, the Library of Congress is supposed to have a copy of every book ever written in the United States and published. 130 million books. Isn't it interesting God ever only wrote one? And there it is right now in your lap. Isn't that amazing? Recognition of biblical authority. Paul says you received it not... As the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. We are living in a generation of Christians that has become very casual, very careless, very complacent about the word of God. I have a very close pastor friend who right now is working through the the very difficult experience of losing people in his church simply because he took a position on a biblical issue that is as clear as John 3.16, but it affected the lives of some people who were in a leadership position and they had another view of the issue and said, we're going to do what we want rather than what God wants. They left, and now others are leaving. And and it's basically taking a church and turning it into chaos. You know what the problem is? Biblical authority. Biblical authority. A willingness to do exactly what God says because God said it. Well, let me give you the third thing this morning. Number one, there must be the reception of God's truth. Number two, the recognition of biblical authority. Thirdly, a response of willing obedience. Let's go back to our verse. Verse 13, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. How does the Word of God work in my life? 
Well, I will tell you this. It does nothing if I'm just a hearer. I, I don't know, Pastor, maybe you've kind of had to work through this, but I, I sometimes struggle standing at the back door supposedly greeting people after a Sunday morning service because some of the things they say just drive me nuts. You have people who will walk up to you and give you that kind of proper handshake and say, uh, that was a nice speech. And I just say, great. Wow, you really made me think this morning. (sighs) Okay. Wow, that held my attention. Oh. And, And you know, it amazes me that people, again, handle it like they went to some community event, a political rally, a lecture series. They heard it, but that's all they did. You know, I enjoy eating at buffets. Now, I I already have walked all over Guernsey, Wyoming this morning. I haven't found the one here. Maybe there is one somewhere. I was hoping there'd be Old Country Buffet or Ryan's or Golden Corral. There's got to be one in this town. I mean, come on, there ain't. (laughs) <laughs> it's not here. I've looked all over the place for it. Nonetheless, I like a buffet. You know why? Because I can take what I want and I can leave what I want. If I want more of this, I get more of this. If I don't want any of that, I don't get any of that. It's, it's up to me. I can do what I want. Can I tell you this morning that that's the attitude a lot of folks have toward the Word of God? In the book of James, chapter 1, we've got a unique little passage there about verses 22 to 24, something like that, 25, that talks about two kinds of people. The first kind of people are hearers. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. Most of you this morning are hearing the Word of God. Now, we've got a couple fellas that aren't, but I'm not worried about them. They, they probably need the nap right now, so we'll just let them sleep, and I'm not going to make any issue out of that. Uh, I don't worry when six and under sleep in my message. It's, the, it's the, the 12 and overs that I get worried about. But nonetheless, uh, here's what happens. Here's what happens. Hearers just simply hear. But that passage then goes on about and talks about doers. And the fact that doers respond. And then in the passage it uses a unique little picture. A man beholding his face in a glass. Now, in our terminology, a glass would be a mirror. Folks, uh, one of the things that you learn about living in a trailer like we do a lot of the time, RVs, they put a lot of mirrors in them. They really do. You know why they do it? Because it makes them look bigger. It's, it's kind of a, a, a little play on your mind. It makes it look like a bigger area. But do you know what that means? It means you've got to look at yourself a lot. Folks, I just came home Friday from 11 days in the mountains on an elk hunt. I didn't have to look at myself for 11 days in a mirror. (laughs) But when I got home and looked in the mirror and saw my sunburned face, Skin that was already peeling from the sunburn. Two weeks of white whiskers. Chapped lips. 
you know, all these incredible things that happen when you don't have hot water, running water, shaving cream, and soap, and all the... I got to be honest with you. I didn't think I really liked what I saw. <laughs> now, my wife claimed she was glad to see me. I still haven't figured that out because it, was, it just couldn't have been that pretty. But nonetheless, what am I saying? I looked in a mirror. I got home Friday afternoon, Friday evening, walked in the trailer and stood there and looked at myself in a mirror and went, oh, this is not good. I do not like this at all. But suppose I had just walked away and said, so what? No problem. Would anything have changed in my life? Nothing would have changed. But look at me this morning. Looking pretty good, huh? Well, no, looking better. Let's put it that way, all right? I, I don't think good is an appropriate term at this point in life. But looking better. You want to know why? Because I looked at myself in the mirror and said, you know what, buddy? This picture needs some attention. And I went to work and I did something about it. Folks, God's Word, this book, is like a mirror. You know what always amazes me? I, I've preached before and had people come up to me and say, you knew I was here, didn't you? That sermon was just for me, wasn't it? Were you aiming at me this evening? And I go, no. No, I really wasn't. All I did was open the Word of God and like a mirror, show people what God says. And you know what? The mirror showed them there's something wrong. You know when their life is changed? When that effectual work takes place? When they then respond to what they saw in the mirror. Now, you look in a mirror and you don't like what you see, you can just pick up your shoe and break the mirror. Or you can just turn the light off so you can't see yourself. Or you can walk into the other room and not look. Doesn't change a thing. The only time things change are when you look into that mirror and you see the way you really are and then you do something about that's why James 1 25 says whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word this man shall be blessed in his deed tonight in the evening service I'm going to present to you a printed copy of what we call our personal revival journal we're going to use it all week, every service. Two columns, what God has said, what I must do. So that every service we walk out of here knowing exactly what God wants us to do. You know what? When that happens, God's Word will effectually work in us. Now let me summarize this whole Sunday school lesson. So what do I do about it? Four words I want to give you. And they all start with the letter A. Word number one, ask. Psalm 119 and verse 18 says, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Are you willing to come to every one of these services saying, God, please speak to me? You know what? Sometimes we have not because we ask not. So let's ask. Number two, accept. A-C-C-E-P-T. Psalm 119, verse number 66 Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. 
In other words, believe that it is God's word. Accept it and its authority over my life, over your life. Thirdly, apply. Psalm 119, verse 34, Give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. See, what changes your life is not what happens in this auditorium. It's what happens after you leave this auditorium. When you live in obedience to what God has said. And finally, act. Psalm 119, verse 44. So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. What is God saying to me? And what do I need to do about it? We've become a very passive generation of Christians. We need to be an active generation of Christians. We need to be living in complete obedience. To what God says. Folks, I don't know what God wants to do in your life during this week of meetings. I don't know what He's going to speak to you about. I don't know what He's going to ask you to do. But I can tell you that it is going to be crucial that you and I allow God's Word to effectively work in us through receiving it recognizing its authority and responding in obedience to it. When that happens, God will be at work. Father, I pray that you will take these simple thoughts, these simple truths, and that you will apply them to our hearts and to our lives. And may we, as your people, allow the Word of God to make a difference in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Keep this sheet just tucked in your Bible. We're going to reference it from time to time and allow it to sort of be a a guide for us this week as we consider God's work of revival in our lives.